This is Duke University. Part of what I'm going to talk about is um, international accountability and transitional justice efforts and so, some of the changes in the last 30 years since Nunca Mas, and um, in particular the type of litigation that the Center for Justice and Accountability engages in. We do, um, we work in a field that's um, where we do what something's called universal jurisdiction and I'm not sure if folks are familiar with that. It's a doctrine of international law which holds that there are certain crimes that are so egregious that the perpetrators may be held to account wherever they are found. It was, a, it's a doctrine that provided the legal foundation for the Nuremberg trials. And um, more recent events since Nunca Mas include the arrest of Chilean General Augusto Pinochet in London, uh, pursuant to an arrest warrant from Spain, the arrest of uh, former um, Peruvian President Fujimori in Chile, pursuant to arrest warrant from Peru, the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, the prosecution of Liberian dictator Charles Taylor in Sierra Leone. Um, all of this um, the, 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 these examples show the growing determination of the international community to carry forward the legacy of Nuremberg of trying people responsible for crimes that shock the conscience. Um, as Patrick explained, I'm a litigator. I've um, actually been a litigator now for 30 years. And prior to my time at CJA, I worked um, in the U.S. courts, mostly on, on, on white-collar uh, crime cases. So I spent many times building big, giant, complex cases back in the day where we had boxes, evidence rooms as big as this room filled with boxes of documents. Um, and then that changed to e-rooms where we had computer evidence room filled with, with all, all these boxes of documents. And um, in, what happens to lawyers lots of times is you get all caught up in minutia of things. So you're tracing money in a money laundering case, or you're caught up in uh, threshold legal issues of is this case going to be able to go to trial? Or is there a jurisdiction? Has the statute of limitations run on the case or not? Is there some defense that's going to bar the case from going into court, like an immunities issue or different things? And we get caught up in what becomes very complicated things, and, and then there's a tendency sometimes to lose sight of the people involved. And so the most important thing for these cases, be them big white-collar cases where you're interviewing, as I have, the Enron traders who came up with the idea of Death Star and stuff like that, or um, in, in these human rights cases. So part of what I wanted to figure out a way to talk about is a little bit about the bigger context of this work, but also how we work with our clients and who they are and the communities that they come from. We've partnered with Eduardo um, in the past with a case that we did involving the Markham Massacre. Maybe talk about that a little bit because you would think as human rights lawyers what we're doing is we're spending our time thinking about did General Rios Montt know that troops under his command were committing genocide? Or did the former Minister of Defense from Somalia really actual order the bombing of Hargeza? Or did somebody else do it? Or did General uh, Vitas Casanova, who lives in Miami, by the way, you know, did he know that the four American church women were tortured and raped and killed under his watch? Did he know that, you know, 12,000 civilians were killed? Um, so instead we do these other things and we get sidetracked. And, 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 and not speaking just for CJA, but in general about human rights lawyers, we're often criticized for not being as close to the clients as we could or should be or the issues. And so part of what I would like to... Um, what I hope is ultimately a paper is, is think about more is how, how can we do this better. The um, Center for Justice and Accountability was founded by a torture treatment therapist who was treating um, a Bosnian survivor who had uh, ran into his torturer in San Francisco and became re-traumatized by that experience. He ended up um, at SF General having had a psychotic break. And um, because we were founded by a torture treatment therapist, we've always been more connected to our clients. Uh, we're part of the 
National Consortium of Torture Treatment Providers. We're part of the California Consortium of Tre Torture Treatment Providers. So we have a more of a focus that's client um, centered. And we, um, you know, in the cases, these, you know, in order for a survivor of some of the stories that you just heard from, from uh, Kimberly and to testify, I mean, it's a very, very, very difficult thing to come forward and tell your story. Um, and so the people who choose to do this, so all the plaintiffs in our cases are people who choose to do this, have um, something in common. And one, is, and one of the things is resilience. And, and an extraordinary amount of resilience. And one of the very hopeful things about this field to me is how resilient we are as people um, and how much we feel that as people working in the field, how we can um, benefit from the resilience of our, of our clients and our partners in this, in this work. Because the stories are really hard to hear. I mean, I was having a hard time listening to the stories in the last presentation. Um, so imagine what it's like if you have to tell that story again of what happened to you and you have to tell it first if you get asylum in this country to the, you know, to your attorney, then you have to say it to the asylum officer, then you have to say it, I don't know how many immigration people. If you're going to be in, a, in one of these cases, you, you get deposed many times. You're in court, you're cross-examined. Um, it's re-traumatizing. So our clients know that if they're going to have to tell their story again, that they'll go through a period of having the nightmares come back. Most of our clients have uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress um, disorder, which is not, um, there's no cure for that. So you can uh, learn to control it and management and have um, some, and part of getting involved in this litigation is having some control over the experience. That's a way of owning your experience, but it never fully goes away. So um, we uh, had a case a number of years ago that went to the Supreme Court on, uh, against General Ali Samantar, the man I mentioned who was the Minister of Defense from Somaliland, who lives in Fairfax, Virginia, if you ever want to visit him. And um, our client, Basha Youssef, when we were getting um, ready for him, he wasn't even testifying, but we were just going to the Supreme Court. and. Um, he was having mixed feelings about going in a way, because he knew it was really important, but he, he also knew it was gonna be really hard for him to get back to work, because he was gonna have to spend all this time thinking about it and he, when he worked in a tech company, and it was hard for him to come back to work after he had spent time having to relive his six years in solitary confinement, being tortured many, many times. Um, and the other thing, I, I'm a little bit out of order here, but one of the things I wanna say about Mr. Youssef, um, is, so he was in solitary confinement in six, for six years in, in Somalia under the Syed Bari regime. And they would, they, it's not total solitary confinement. Like once a week, they would get out for an hour. And he was in a row of men. There were 15 men in a long row. And they were all people that were arrested because they were part of a civic group like the Rotary Club. And they were trying to organize to have the teachers paid more and to have the garbage picked up and stuff like that. So that was a threat, right? Because they were organizing and doing something that the state found threatening. So one of the coping mechanisms, which is part of this whole resilience thing, that they developed is a knocking code so they could communicate with each other through the cells, kind of a Morse code. One of the um, prisoners had a copy of Anna Karenina so Somalia, as you might know, was a former British and Italian colony, and, they, and Somaliland is still English-speaking and in Amen. So they had a copy of Anna Karenina. They knocked the whole book out, letter by letter, word by word, all across this row. And he says that's part of how they kept their sanity, was they also had a Time magazine that they knocked the code out. So part of what's really interesting about this work is meeting the people who were already really interesting in their own country, right? Somebody who's organizing to make his community and neighborhood a better place, gets arrested for doing that, comes out of prison after this horrific experience, makes it to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, um, and then chooses to become a plaintiff in one of these lawsuits. And knowing that they're not, in our cases, we don't really hardly ever collect any actual money or anything like that. It's to make a bigger, 
to make a bigger point. Um, so it's the privilege of working with like Avasha Yusuf is I can't begin to say how um, important it is. Um, so I wanted, so I promised that I would give a little bit of an overview. Um, so in the past, there's, so the, how does this litigation happen? There's five different arenas where these types of cases go on. There are the tribunals that I just mentioned, the ICTY and the ICTR. Um, there's the International Court, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, the, um, the ICC was established in, two, in 2002. There are regional bodies where lawsuits are brought against the state. So there's the Inter-American Court, and there's the European Court of Human Rights, and there's also a regional body in Africa now that hasn't really started litigating. Um, but those are against the whole nation state. There's the universal jurisdiction cases, which I just mentioned, um, like which we call universal jurisdiction cases. They're civil and criminal cases that are done in national courts. So they're not at a tribunal, they're not at the ICC, they're not at a regional body, but they're in national courts. And that's the core of the work that CJA does. Um, there's a uh, relatively new-ish phenomenon or experiment, which is a hybrid tribunal in Cambodia, which is known as the Extraordinary Chamber Court in the Chambers of Cambodia, ECCC for short. That was a tribunal that was set up um, half international uh, and half domestic. So the idea was that uh, there would be an international tribunal with international judges, international defense attorneys, international prosecutors, and lawyers for the victims, and that would be paired with uh, the same setup for domestic people, and uh, Cambodia didn't, does, did not have a, a very uh, established court system at all. And that, so the idea is they would set the structure up and then leave a court system in place. So it's a hybrid because the lawyers, unlike the, the tribunals, the lawyers are both international and they're in country. And the hope, the hope was that this would be a different model that would resonate more with the people in, um, in country. It's had mixed results. And, um, and then finally, there are in-country prosecutions, like the Fujimori prosecution in Peru, the Rios Mont prosecution in Guatemala, and all the prosecutions that have been going on in Argentina and Chile. Um, uh, let me see. So, so a watershed event in our field was in 1998 when Pinochet was arrested in London. The, uh, the fact that a former head of state was, was arrested pursuant to an arrest warrant from a court in Spain uh, for crimes that he committed in Chile was really quite extraordinary. Um, and it changed the face of how people were thinking about this work and how we were going to do all of this work. Co totally coincidentally, CJA was formed the same year. Um, and early on helped develop evidence for the Pinochet prosecution from the members of the Chilean diaspora here in the United States. Um, when CJA was founded, and, and so this is one of the ways in which the field has evolved. The first case we did was, a, was um, on behalf of four Bosnian Muslim survivors against a Serbian soldier who had also happened to be in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and our early... And we've filed cases on behalf of survive, uh, survivors involving human rights abuses. These are all cases we filed in the United States for Chile, China, Colombia, East Timor, El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti, Peru, and Somalia. So in all the cases we do in the United States, the bad guy has to be here. That's the way our laws here in the United States work. But the crime can happen anywhere else, and it's civil litigation. Early on, there's a, a list of bad guys in the country that have been living here that were fairly notorious. So we did lawsuits against them without thinking very much about the bigger picture, without thinking very much about transitional justice or what was going on in the home country, but mostly just focused on, here's this bad guy here. How do we prove this case and how do we do it quickly? Our model was working with pro bono law firms and lawyers tend to want to just win a case and do it quickly. And uh, Kimberly and I were talking about this the other day, about why aren't sexual violence crimes included in a lot of human rights prosecutions? And some prosecutors have said to her, well, because that just complicates things. It makes the case harder to prove. We can already get them on crimes against humanity. Why would we bother doing that? Um, we had a similar tension in our early years with the lawyers we were working with from big law firms, because our clients and our, our partners wanted to have show trials, right? We wanted to go in and tell a big story about what happened. 
We did a case against one of the architects of the assassination of Archbishop Romero in El Salvador, who was living in Modesto, California, and he defaulted. So he didn't even show up. But we put on three days of evidence about what happened that day, including eyewitness accounts, including getting in the photographer who took the pictures right afterwards, testifying so the pictures came into evidence, including Reverend Whiffler, who was the last person to receive communion from, from Romero, Bob White, the ambassador, for those of you who saw the retro report, but the, the ambassador who stood up, <laughs> the US ambassador to El Salvador who stood up and spoke the truth about what was happening there and Al Haig fired him. Um, so all those people testified and it was the first time a court had heard evidence about what had happened. Um, so our outside counsel, by that point, we were understood and appreciated what we were doing, but you know, in a default case, you don't have to do anything. You, you just win if they don't show up. But so part of why we were doing this was to help create a record of truth and in the hopes that at some point in El Salvador, if the amnesty law is ever repealed, <laughs> there's a prosecution there, that this evidence can be useful. So we started working in more of a transitional justice context, which is what you're going to be speaking about, and using our cases as um, a vehicle for something uh, bigger. Um, uh, so, so, so I guess I'm going to give a couple more examples of that. Yeah, the Guatemalan genocide case in um, Spain, which we got involved with in 2006. It had been filed years earlier. And the case had been stalled for a number of of legal and political reasons, but there was there was a sh there's a shift in Guatemala. Civil society has been very active there for very many years. There was were more and more people that were focused toward doing some type of litigation in country. Uh, CJA and um, Professor Naomi wrote Ariaza and others uh, came up with a strategy of using the case in Spain to keep the uh, keep things going, introduce a lot of evidence keep the idea of justice alive with the hope that one day it would be used in a prosecution in Guatemala. So over the years, dozens of survivors testified in Spain, um, uh, expert witnesses t t testified about genocide, about sexual violence, about um, Plan Sofia, which was a document that had all this evidence of the, how the police and the military were working together, and um, with no idea of what would happen and when it would happen. But a conscious decision that that was evidence would be used somewhere else. And the Guatemalan Evidence Project was developed that OSI funded with the idea of gathering information about the structure of the military and the police that could be used in either a trial in Spain, a trial in Guatemala, in the Inter-American Court, wherever. That we'll just get it all ready so it can be used any place. And um, as, as most of you know, and that really then did in fact happen. Rios Montt was ultimately prosecuted in Guatemala. And so much of the evidence that we introduced there was also then introduced in Guatemala. We helped prepare the same witnesses who were doing very similar testimony. And it was an extraordinary moment, I would say, for the human rights community, for the people of Guatemala, and for the arc of this work that we can use and an, 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 sort of a UJ prosecution in another country to help support this extraordinarily meaningful transitional justice effort in the home country. Sadly, uh, 10 days later, politics intervened. The decision, the conviction of Rios Mon on genocide aside uh, was reversed Before, you know, for, for political reasons, which is extraordinarily discouraging. Um, but at the same time, it's important to recognize you know, what had happened. I mean, nothing like that had ever, had ever happened. Um, we did a similar thing with Peru and the Acamarca massacre. We, um, we were approached by some civil society groups in Peru because two of the people responsible for that massacre were living in the United States, one in Maryland and one in Florida. And, um, and, there, were, and there were two victims groups that, were, that are, and those victim groups, uh, you, know, you know, people who had organized for years with the hope of having justice someday. They had lawyers, they were working with um, lawyers in country. And then this idea of a strategy was developed that we'll file a lawsuit in the United States. Hopefully by doing that, that will help support efforts to hold um, this Hurtado and um, Rivera Redon accountable in Peru. It, 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 I think, was successful in some way. Eduardo Gonzalez testified about what he 
uncovered about that massacre in, in, the, in, the, in the Truth Commission. The two clients who were young women at the time, they were 12 years old, I believe, came up and testified, which I think was extraordinarily important for them and for their community. Um, Hurtado was ultimately uh, extradited to Peru based on uh, human rights crimes, which to our knowledge is the first time that anybody's been extradited from the United States to another country based on a, on a human rights issue. Our country, we are happy to deport people, but we're not as interested in honoring extradition requests. We have a case right now in Spain, the um, Jesuit massacre case from El Salvador. One of the defendants from that case lives in Boston, Massachusetts, and he was recently convicted of immigration crimes, and um, there's an extradition request pending from Spain. Now, we don't know what our government will do, but if they do extradite him to Spain to stay on trial, it will be, again, we wanted these really extraordinary moments in this field. Um, okay, so that, so that's sort of, I'm chaptering that for a minute. I wanted to, uh, other sort of changes I wanted to say is the, the issue of sexual violence that we've heard a fair amount about today. Um, Early on in our cases, we didn't focus also on sexual violence charges, and I don't think others in the field did. The first time we did was in a case that we filed in 2004 against, it was filed in New York against Emmanuel Toto Constant, who was head of a death squad in um, Haiti called FRAP, the Rev Revolutionary Front for, for, for the Advancement and Progress of Haiti. He, they used a systematic campaign of rape against women to silence the opposition. They raped the mothers, um, wives, sisters, and daughters of pro-democracy activists and women who are pro-democracy activists, and not just once. They would go again and again and do this. The women in this in Haiti, which is different than I think some of the stories we heard, banded together and formed a group. And actually, one of our clients um, and her uh, uh, fellow survivors actually d d developed a play that they would put on about what had happened to them. Um, so anyhow, Constant moved to Bro the Bronx, New York, and became a, a mortgage broker. <laughs> and um, we filed the suit on behalf of the clients using do the, as does, though, because it was still too dangerous for them to go public. He defaulted, so he didn't appear at, I mean, he was deposed in this case and was involved in various ways, but then he defaulted, so he didn't show up for the damages hearing. But so our clients, we um, filed a whole lot of motions so that they could testify behind a screen. So they got to have their day of court, they got to testify, and they got to do it while protecting their uh, privacy, um, which, is a, which is also just extraordinarily important. and. Um, and it's complicated because a lot of our ca our clients still don't want to talk about these issues. So we're we're or, or, I mean we're all sort of working with this in a way uh, as best as, as best that we can. Um, another really big change that's happened in this field is what I like to think of as transnational litigation. Um, and the example I have of that is, uh, it's again involving Haiti. There was, in 1994, there was a massacre in Gonaive that became known as the Rabbit Hill Massacre, where dozens of unarmed citizens were killed. And um, there was a period of democracy in Haiti where the um, BAI, I don't want to speak French, but anyhow, a, group, a BAI, an country group of attorneys, human rights attorneys, and the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti got together um, and were um, and partnered with some government lawyers, and they had the Rabbitoh massacre trial. So it was a prosecution that was done with, in adherence with what we would say international law standards. It was fair. It was open. And um, a, a number of people were convicted of their role in the massacre, inc including Colonel Carl Dorelli. And, and there was a judgment against them, a monetary judgment. There's another coup. People are released from prison. Durellian uh, is released from prison, moves to Florida, wins the lottery, goes on TV, has a big check. And, um, and uh, we get involved and do two things. One is we take the Haitian judgment and use it to file an action in the state court in the United States to attach his lottery winnings. Again, first time a human rights judgment in another country, in Haiti, is used in a US court in the United States 
in this way, because in civil litigation, you can't attach or get anything unless you have a judgment. And then we file our regular federal human rights lawsuit. This case goes on for years and years and years and years and years, as these things always do. Um, and, um, but finally, when we have our trial in um, Florida, our client, Marie Jean, we have two clients that testify. We, she comes up from Haiti. Now, here's a woman whose husband was killed in this massacre. She's very poor. She has young children. She's part of a victim's organization that's been organizing for years around the massacre, which is, not a, which is a dangerous thing to do in Haiti. She goes to Port-au-Prince to take a plane to come to Florida. She's never been to Port-au-Prince. She'd never been in air conditioning. She'd never been in an airport, any of this kind of stuff. She then comes to Florida, never been in an elevator, <laughs> never been in a courtroom, and she's coming to testify. And the only way we got her actually even in the country was getting Nancy Pelosi's office involved because our government doesn't like to let Haitians in because they think they're going to stay or whatever. She became very sick while the trial was going on. And um, she kept um, going to the bathroom and throwing up. And I went and tried to figure <coughs> out what was going on with her and what was going on as the following. She wasn't eating at all because she had no money and her children had no food. So as long as they couldn't eat, she wasn't going to eat. But somebody told her she should take vitamins. So that's what she was doing. So uh, anyhow, we figured a way to get some money to her children so they would have food so that she could start eating again so she could testify. But it was extraordinary to sit there and see what this woman was going through to do this and what a survivor she is. So then we end up winning, and she ends up getting a sum of money just for herself, $450,000. And so think about how much money that is. So what does she do with that money? She shares it with 80 other people in her victims association in Haiti. So, so it's very, the people who do this are, this is a much bigger cause than you know, it's just so important to, um, well, I, it's just a privilege to, 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 uh, to work with them. Um, so what I, and so in the course of this work, one of the things that I haven't been able to figure out is I thought that this would be a job that would be hard. Like, I found this morning hard to listen to a lot of the things that we were talking about. Um, but at the same time, it's a very hopeful field because we can transcend all of this stuff. And if Asha Yusuf can sit in prison and figure out how to knock out Anna Karenina, and if Marie Jean can come up to the United States and testify and, um, about this, you know, in this way, in a, in, a, in a courthouse in the United States where the judge wouldn't even say her name right. He made up a name for her because he didn't like her name. He said, I don't like that, you know. And so, so <laughs> it's so unusual how the U.S. system sometimes works. So then um, it's just, it, it gives you this, this feeling of uh, what they call secondary resilience. Um, and so I've been thinking about resilience a fair amount and come to find out that people are writing books about this and actually it's been studied a fair amount. I had no idea. Um, a friend of mine mailed me this book by Andrew Zoli on resilience and why things bounce back. And it turns out there are all these researchers that have been writing about this since Nuremberg and in all different contexts. Um, so he has a definition of resilience that I think is useful. Um, it's the capacity of a system, enterprise, or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. So for me, the key to this is the uh, maintain its core purpose and integrity. So what's the, when the state is torturing you, what they're trying to do is take away your core purpose. They're trying to take away your identity. I mean, that's the key. So you don't have an identity anymore. When women are being raped, it's to try to dehumanize. And the other thing about resilience is there are people who also have an ability to, to delay gratification in service of future goals. So I think the people who choose to be involved in litigation, which goes on forever, are, are those... Are those um, are those people. And so I, so I think part of our challenge is, is how do we as lawyers and how do we as the human rights community um, 
more fully appreciate and understand the individuals, and not just the clients, because it's also the witnesses, because often you're not a client in a case, you're not a plaintiff, so you don't have that identity, but you have a really important part of information that you're going to have to testify about. And, um, and then how do you feel connected to the lawyers and the people that you're working with, and then to the other people in the cases? One of the things that um, we've started to do at CJA, is we've done this twice, is have client conferences where we've brought together clients from across cases and countries to talk about their experiences as survivors. And you know, one of the things that's so... Uh, we had when I, we had this one day, and there was, you know, a client, we had two clients, one from um, Honduras and one from El Salvador, with El Salvador, and was been living in Sweden, because he, that was where he got asylum. And they're meeting in a hotel, and, we, and I sent a young woman that we were working with to pick them up to bring them over to our office, and she grew up in Guatemala, so she's fluent in Spanish, and so these two meet, and they're kind of in the elevators, and they right away started showing their scars to each other which is a really common thing for survivors to do, even if you haven't met before. Um, so, so this being able to share across cases is really experience, but also be, to be able to share that we're doing this litigation together. Because lots of times your community maybe doesn't understand it. Some cultures appreciate it more than other cultures do. Um, sometimes your family doesn't want you to do it. Um, um, Basha Yusuf, who I mentioned earlier, his wife didn't want him. Um, I and mean, she had very mixed feelings about it. She alternated to being supportive and not, because it's, it's also can be dangerous for your family members. It's very, 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 very complicated. Um, so it, it's the client conference idea was a, it came from one of our clients, Cecilia Moran, who um, lives and works on Long Island right now, who is a student in El Salvador when she was arrested and, and, and tortured. And she, um, she speaks out and gets involved for lots of reasons, but one is because of her son. She has a son who's college age now, but um, she wants him to know that he can have any type of future that he wants. And she thought she was the person that had this idea of let's have, let's have, let's have a let's have a reunion and see. What, and that's what she was calling. It. She would call it a reunion, but and. So, and but and share stories, and also with stories about what works for them and what doesn't work for them in the trials. One of the things that's hard, and less so, I think, with CJA, but with the tribunal, is, is turnover. There's a lot of turnover of the attorneys in these cases, especially in the international cases, and that's maybe not a good model. Um, in the national court prosecutions, it's different because you're working with the same people all along. Let's see. Um, I guess I also wanted to mention um, Safani Bay. She's a, a survivor from the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. She had three small children that were um, killed, basically, in front of her. She um, left Cambodia you know, a very long time ago and ended up in the United States and always knew she wanted justice. She always had that idea. So she got to testify in the second Khmer Rouge trial. What's um, interesting about how this movement has changed over the years is there's much more involvement on behalf of the victims and the survivors. They have a bigger voice. At the Khmer Rouge tribunal, there are victims' counsel. They're in the courtroom every day. They get to uh, ask questions of the witnesses and cross-examine. One of, one of our lawyers is admitted to the bar there. So you, you go into court and you play a similar role to the defense attorneys and the prosecutors. And um, so she got to have her day in court. That's quite amazing from, from, from her perspective. And her goal, if she could have anything, anything that she wanted in the world, it would be a school named after her children in Phnom Penh, where they taught in the French way. It's not money. It's not anything, right? It's about education. And it's about the memory of her children, who she thinks of every day. Um, so wrapping up, uh, the other thing that's been going on, of course, is a big backlash to this type of litigation in Spain, where there's, which was a great progressive hope for uh, universal jurisdiction litigation. There have been two series of reforms that have happened that have greatly restricted the reach of these laws but due to outside pressure from principally China and the United States. Um, it's uh, the Guatemalan genocide case and the judges' massacre case are still going forward, but the future looks not 
great. I mean, there's a lot of attempts to try to make it better in Spain, but we're not sure what's going to happen. Here in the United States, the Supreme Court has greatly limited the reach of the Alien Tort Statute, which is one of the two laws that we use. Um, there's a, our, one of our cases, there's a chance they'll grant certain one of our cases again, so we're all a little bit nervous about that. The, in our cases here in the United States that are civil cases, amicus briefs get filed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, by the government of Sri Lanka, by Rumsfeld. You know, it's, and, um, it's, 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 a, it's a, it's Attorney General McKenzie. It's quite a, an array of people that don't want these lawsuits to go forward and pay attention to you know, civil litigation here in the United States. So we have to keep being nimble and rolling with it and changing and looking at state law claims again. The other thing that um, is, uh, I think we need to be much more mindful of is backlashes in the, um, in the, in the home countries. Well, we've had the national court prosecutions, which we just saw in Guatemala. There's been a different type of backlash in Peru, I'd say. Um, in, we don't, you know, obviously things are looking great right now in Argentina and Chile, but it's, it's just, it's a, it's a thing to be mind, it's to be mindful of. And, um, I think the other thing that's really, 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 really important for litigators is to work with a larger, broader community and civil society and, and to build the cases with an eye towards using them as a, as a vehicle and an organizing principle and um, really taking your time to make sure that you've built the right coalitions and the right bridges and you have all the um, right relationships set up. A real benefit of being a U.S.-based organization is that we're, in, we're perceived as being in, independent. So sometimes that's a real benefit. I mean, it can be not always a benefit, but sometimes we can come in and be a little bit of the other and that can help smooth the way for some of these cases. We um, slow things down or speed them up, oftentimes depending on what our partners want and what they feel is, is important. And then um, just coming back again to the point about the clients is, and then they have, to have, they have to be in it with you too. They have to feel that this is about them and their legacy and their story. And, you, and, and, and um, I do think that's the part that CJA does really well, but we could also do much more of. So thank you for inviting me and for keeping the spirit of Mr. Mars alive. <laughs> you mentioned that um, some of the people that you were prosecuting made their way over here to the U.S. and um, started, like one of the guys you said became a mortgage broker. Um, and I guess one of the questions that came up in my head is like, how are they able to get here when they've done those crimes in other places? But then at the same time to hear the result is like, okay, is it a plus or a minus because since he did get here and you were able to get a hold of him or the guy who won the lottery, was that a benefit because you got to prosecute him in the end? Or is it a bad thing because they basically just went from murdering to becoming my mortgage broker? Lots of times they're former allies of our government. So we let them in. Like the Constant was worked with the CIA. So, for instance. so that's often how they get here. That the. The U.S. has changed their policy on these things. There's now a, a, a human rights section in the Justice Department and also in ICE that um, actively tr uh, tries to keep these bad guys out and or bring removal cases against the ones that are here. And in one instance, Chucky e. Taylor, Charles, Charles Taylor's son, he was actually prosecuted using the criminal torture statute. Um, the, uh, so that's changing, but the... Um, Actually, in the case of the Constant, the one who's the mortgage broker, he's in, he's in prison right now in New York because we also then worked with the attorney general's office to help with their prosecution of him on mortgage fraud. He had actually a really he had a really low sentence deal. He was going to get a year and a day sentence, and we flew up an attorney from Haiti to testify at his sentencing, and we put in all this evidence of all the horrible, horrible stuff that he did. And the judge said, "I'm not going to sentence him to this. Come back with a deal that I can." live with. And the defendant said, well, I'm not going to agree then. I'm going to go to trial. So he went to trial and totally lost. And he got 12 years in jail. Um, 12 years for mortgage fraud. Yes, not for, right. So we have a, we have a civil judgment against him that's money. Um, what happens nowadays with our cases is once we're doing our cases and the government finds out about it, they often are involved too, and they'll end up doing removal cases. But we will fight them if we don't want somebody removed to a country where we think they'll be more dangerous. So we always go into that 
calculus so constant, we didn't want him to go back to Haiti because we think he's very dangerous. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a mixture. I would say from the perspective of our clients, it's always good to have any kind of a judgment. So, cause, so the truth is told about what happened to them. Because torture is about silencing. Trials to create a narrative of truth. And it seems like it's simultaneously a collaborative narrative of truth. Because you have different partners who are structuring how that narrative comes together as it is prepared to become testimony. It's also edited because it's not just the words of. Uh, the testifier that's shaped by the litigator in terms of how it might be used. And it also seems to me this is a process that the opposition uh, has the opportunity uh, to co-opt and use at the same time uh, as a way of actually undermining the truth that comes about. In yeah, litigation, you have to work within some some ground rules. So you're right that the testimony has to be shaped, it may be presented in a way that it actually will go into evidence. But the, um, and then the defense attorney is cross-examined. So is that what you mean about the other side? Well, the, uh, right. And the, the other side, I imagine, uses outreach to other forms of shaping the narrative. Oh, absolutely. Oh, sure, absolutely. They say. So it's a um, battle of the truth for history. Oh, yeah, no question. Yeah, sure. The other side has their own PR, and, you know, Rio Smont trial is a perfect example. He had huge PR machines talking about all he was doing is making the country safe from communism. Um, there's uh, impugning the uh, integrity of the witnesses, is, 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 yes, absolutely, certainly part of this. Strategy are in a number of our clients that the defendants had put on evidence about that they were on the CIA payroll and they actually put in, you know, like kind of the pay stub type of thing. So, yeah, there's, there's the counter narrative, um, absolutely. But um, I, I, I think that those of us in this field believe that, it's, that it all, in the end, mostly shakes out and in, 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 in you get to the right place. Um, I want to thank you for your, your uh, speech today. Um, but my first comment was about your, your, you made a comment that a PTSD is not something that's ever cured or goes away, and I wanted to push back against that. I'm a clinician and a researcher. I, just, I study justice mechanisms around the world, looking at the psychosocial impact of, of justice mechanisms. And I, I think it's probably fair to say that this notion that people get closure, this idea that it's a, they can close that wound that they had, I agree 100% with you, that, you know, someone who loses their their wife, their son, their daughter is raped. That never goes away, of course. And I completely agree with that concept that no one will ever achieve closure regardless of justice outcomes. But the separate issue of whether or not PTSD can be cured and go away, I would disagree with your comments on that. I, I, you know, there really is pretty good evidence now that under some circumstances with the right treatment, PTSD absolutely can be cured. So I would draw a distinction between those two. Okay. Uh, then the second comment I wanted to make was about the idea of resilience. And it, you define resilience as maintaining that integrity. Mm -hmm. And people in the PTSD world have been thinking about resilience now for about 10, 15 years. And actually, it's kind of interesting. I, I like the distinction that people have drawn. They, the, the, what you're defining as resilience, they've tended to define as resistance. That is, and not changing and maintaining but resilience is someone who experiences bad things from something bad happening to them and then bounces back using that kind of classical sense of resilience as a sense of bouncing back. So they've drawn that distinction between those two. Well, thank you. The only point I want to make is about the closure point. I actually do think people get closure. I do think a lot of our clients get closure but I, about what happened to them, but I don't think that they... Um, in, uh, ever fully escape having recurrences of um, the trauma coming back up. And I'm not saying that there aren't cures, because may maybe that my information is out of date. So, so but, uh, I mean, to me, it was described to me by one of the psychiatrists that we work with, is it's a little bit like alcoholism or something. You can be sober, but you, right, and fine, but you're, it's, you, you know, there's still sort of a tendency. But I think that 
so I don't really know what the field. I'm just understand what I'm saying, but I do think people get closure in a way that is meaningful. Not everybody, obviously, but some people. I guess this. I, I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but I'm curious. Um, in some ways, harking back to the question that um, Aaron asked this morning about this complex relation between something like the civil society, um, in which I would put an organization like the CTJ vis-a-vis -vis the state, right, sort of making demands on the state. What does it mean to, and, and it's just curious what you're thinking about that. Um, how is the state understood? And then, of course, what I'm also interested in is the cross-cutting um, difficulties in trying to think about what comes from making a universal um, jurisdiction case, which is incredibly important. It opens up all these different doors. With a lot of the stuff people have struggled around in Guatemala, of, does that then un- do or does it sort of take some of the pressure off more national level state responses to this? And it's not judging, I'm just curious what you think so about I, that, this sort of tension. From our perspective, the end goal and the right goal is a national court prosecution in country. So you would never pick the cases that we do it here in this country first. You can only bring the cases here if you can't bring the case in the home country. That's the way our laws work in this country. So I would never. I, so I would say that they're a tool with the ultimate thing to be the national court prosecution. Um, we, um, our two Peruvian cases up here actually are on, are on hold and are stayed in favor of the prosecution that's going on in Peru. Like, so we, um, and we have a case involving uh, the man responsible for torture and killing Victor Hara in Chile, which we will stop that at any moment if the prosecution in Chile moves forward. So, so that answers one part of your question. The thing about the state and the prosecutors and the war crime prosecutor units, I would say as a former federal prosecutor, I have very mixed feelings about them and working with them and how it all works and how the state works. But realistically, um, what we all want is the state to prosecute human rights abuses. So we all have mixed feelings about the state, but who else is going to do it? So I think it's our job to try to make the state better. There are very good people that work in these war crime units, but I, I, I um, you know, it's, I think that's who should be doing it. Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.